By 1300 BC, a people speaking an early form of the Greek language had inhabited large portions of mainland Greece. They were known as the Mycenaeans, and for years their wars and scandals, exploits and achievements became the stuff of legend and laid the foundation of Greek civilization. Their capital city of Mycenae was surrounded by a massive citadel built over the course of 150 years. According to myth, it was from this city that the Mycenaeans were led by a king named Agamemnon, whose epic struggles were written down by the 8th century BC poet Homer in two of history's most famous tales, the Iliad and the Odyssey. So the Iliad was something like the Bible for ancient Greeks. It contained a moral story. It told you how you should live. It described gods, it described religion, but also described people, it described situations. It gave ideals that you should look upon. The tales of the Iliad and the Odyssey have become some of the most famous in history. The abduction of Helen by Paris, Agamemnon's 10-year siege of Troy, and the giant wooden horse which the Greeks used to enter Troy and destroy the city. Although Agamemnon's exploits during the Trojan War may have been heroic, his return home to Mycenae was far from a hero's welcome. He was murdered by his own wife. Scholars have debated for centuries whether or not Homer actually penned the Iliad and the Odyssey, or whether he just collected the folk tales of song, or whether he had anything to do with them at all. But if the ancient Greeks came back today, they'd scoff at this pithy harangue. Because of the ancient Greeks, Homer wasn't just some top 40s folk singer, nor was he the best-selling hack writer of some piece of pulp fiction. Homer was an historian. And these legends weren't the bedtime stories to be whispered to the kitties before the oil lamps were blown out. These were accountable facts. This is what is left of Mycenae, the capital city of which Homer writes and where many, including me, would like to believe that Agamemnon really ruled. These ruins show us that not only were these early Greeks master builders, but they were capable of some amazing engineering feats. As you approach Mycenae, first thing, of course, that you will see is the fortification walls, which are very impressive. And immediately you have this feeling of Awesome. The citadel walls of Mycenae are buttressed by stone blocks which weigh up to 10 tons apiece. They were engineered with such precision that each stone fit perfectly in place to its adjacent block. But for awe-inspiring visuals, nothing in Mycenae comes closer than the colossal main entrance to the citadel, the Lion's Gate. This is the Lion's Gate, the main gate to the citadel of Mycenae. It is one of the more stunning structures of all of early antiquity. It is an imposing piece of symbolism. It is an imposing piece of engineering. Two lions standing fully upright, their paws on the base of a column. Their heads, which are missing, would be turning outward. Anybody approaching this gate would know that Mycenae stood for one thing, power. Structurally, the gate looks to be a standard engineering practice of post and lintel construction. These vertical elements here, these massive piers, are the posts supporting the lintel, the horizontal element, which weighs about 12 tons. But it is above the gate where the lions live that the engineers took it one step further. If you look at this triangle of indented stones right by the lions, it develops an element that we call the corbelled arch. Suppose you have these four stones, and instead of piling them up, you try to create an opening from that side and you steal a little bit of space by putting them in this way. This is cobbling. If we are a little bit more ambitious because this is not sufficiently large and we try to displace further these stones, still in cobbling, then 
we are running this risk that this is falling down. So what is the little trick? It's simple. You start putting counterweights behind each of these corbelled stones. Now this triangle, first of all we should say that this is a true Mycenaean innovation. This is something that we see for the first time, most probably worldwide. Uh, so in that sense we are looking at something that's very innovative, very new. The Mycenaean engineers took the corbelled arch one step further. They applied the idea to create a revolutionary interior space called a corbelled dome. The dome was used in only one kind of construction, a tomb. Like the Egyptians, the Mycenaeans built incredible structures to house their leaders in the afterlife. These tombs are called tholos. Their construction departed from anything the Mycenaean engineers had ever done before. I mean, the circular form is completely absent in the architectural minds of the Mycenaeans. The Mycenaeans work with straight lines and, and right angles. So the circle is just for this kind of structure. So that makes the impression and the symbolism of the circle as related to death even stronger. Building a tholos was a giant engineering feat. The first step would have been to hollow out the side of a hill. So they dug this trench, and this trench would form the dromos, which means in Greek road or way. In this case, it's a walkway to the tomb, and it's flanked on each side by these beautiful almond stones set in lengthwise and edgewise. Now, 3,200 years ago in 1200 BC, a visitor approaching would walk down this dromos, and then he would be confronted by an unbelievably magnificent and stunning sight, this massive doorway. The doorway would be flanked by two fantastic columns carved out of solid green marble with zigzag and spiral designs going all the way up. Each one of these massive stones is two and a half feet tall, and there are 33 rings of these stones laid out in a conical shape. Now, each layer of stone is laid over the lower one in a sort of protruding fashion. That's what we mean by the core build style. And then they're shaved down to make it all very smooth. In order for this structure to be stable, you need a constant pressure from outwards, inwards. Very much like a barrel, where you need this band, this metallic band around to keep the rings together. This pressure comes from the addition of earth. As they build, they add earth from around and quite a lot of earth and there comes a point when they have finished the beehive structure inside at the same time they have built a whole earthen mound on top around 1100 bc this early greek civilization suddenly and mysteriously disintegrated and disappeared there's lots of theories about that I think the most dominant one is new tribes, new barbarian tribes came from uh, the steppes and they attacked uh, the civilizations of Egypt, they attacked the civilization of Mesopotamia, causing disruption in the trade routes. But that became their fall. With the fall of Mycenae, Greece entered a dark age. Over four centuries, its culture fell into a deep slumber. Then, in the 8th century BC, individual city-states began to develop and flourish each one forging its own identity, competing for economic, military, and engineering prominence. One Greek island in particular, Samos, would see the construction of one of the most amazing engineering feats seen in the ancient world, moving mountains to bring water to the people.